let's get started. All right, these are just little quick topics of what we're gonna try to cover today. I, I wanna be brief, but I also wanna give you as much information as I can in the short in the time that I'm allotted. So we'll talk a little bit about federal student aid. We'll talk about state aid. We'll talk about institutional aid, which is money from the actual uh, schools that you're attending and scholarships from other sources. Questions that I'll try my best to answer. What is financial aid? <clears throat> I'm doing this from the point of view of a first time parent or student dealing with the financial aid process. Some of you may already be familiar with some of these, but this is based as if this is kind of your first time being introduced to it. Who should complete the FAFSA? Who can get it? How much can you get? Which is just an estimate because that's something that kind of changes depending on funding. How to apply, what happens next, and I'll give you some resources where you can get more information. First up, what is financial aid? Money to pay for school, bottom line. You can get it in the form of grants, which is money you don't have to pay back. We love grants. You can get it in the form of work study, loans, which we'll talk just a smidgen about, and then of course also scholarships. What is the FAFSA? And I put this in here specifically so you can see the first F in FAFSA stands for free. It's the free application for federal student aid. And I say that because every year I get one or two kids that encounter that other FAFSA website. If they ask you for any type of money, you're at the wrong place. You're not wanting to give them money, you're wanting to get money. So you're applying to get money, not to give. So you shouldn't have to pay any type of fees to apply for the financial federal financial aid. So just remember the first F in FAFSA stands for free, free application of federal student aid. This application opens every October 1st and it must be completed at the earliest deadline. And that's important because when they say the early bird gets the worm, early bird gets the worm, excuse me, that's in this type of situation. Sometimes there's a limited amount of money and you may qualify for it. But if you're in that last batch of kids that turn in their financial aid, you may miss out on money that was due that, that you qualify for. So you want to be in this first batch so that you can get all the funds. <clears throat> And this just is a brief overview of who should complete the FAFSA. And so you're due, if you're going into school, going into a four-year university, junior college, training program, um, pursuing your graduate degree, all of these individuals are who needs to apply for FAFSA. And seniors, fall, I mean seniors, fall, not fall, but the class of 2022 is the first group where completing the FAFSA is part of your graduation requirement. So you have to show proof that you've completed your FAFSA or if there's some extenuating circumstances, we do have a form for that, but most students uh, are able to complete the FAFSA and it's part of the graduation requirement. So that's new and it's starting with the, this senior class. <clears throat> These are some of the basics on who can get federal student aid. So you have to be a U.S. citizen or a national um, or what they call an eligible non-citizen and they have a, a list of requirements to fall in that category. Um, have your high school diploma or equivalent. Eligible to get this degree or certificate. Have a valid social security. Now this one, males register for selective service. This is going away. You no longer have to, to do that. Um, but that, that was a requirement at one time, but they're phasing that out. And then to continue to get your service, uh, your financial aid, once you're in school, you have to maintain satisfactory academic progress. So there's going to be some minimum 
a course load that you have to maintain and a minimum GPA once you get in school to continue to receive your money. Now we have some other kind of aids that I talked about in the beginning, in the introduction. Um, states do have aid that they can render, that they can give to schools. And if you apply for financial aid, the FAFSA application usually covers you for the state aid. Um, so you don't have to do, like for example, if you're in Texas, the TASFA. Because if once you do the FAFSA, it's going to cover you for federal and state aid. But if for some reason you don't meet the requirements to complete a FAFSA, then you can actually go in and apply for state aid via TASFA. That's the one for Texas. Colleges are going to also have uh, criteria set up where you can um, apply for scholarships via the college. And then there are some private scholarships as well that are offered. So like Bill Gates, Coca-Cola, these other scholarships, uh, sororities, uh, fraternities, local civic and social groups, different uh, companies like Motiva and Total. So there's, Scott, there's money there. You just have to look for it. And then you would look at the individual scholarship and get the requirements for the eligibility and the application process. Here are some different state aids and scholarships that you can get via FAFSA or TASFA. This is just a small group. Usually these are based on the what's available in the funds for that particular year. So we do have different um, opportunities. So even if you are a student who is not a citizen and you can't fill out the FAFSA, we still have opportunities in Texas where you can still get scholarship money uh, and financial aid. And that resource that I have, I'm going to leave that for a minute because College for All Texans, it's a awesome resource. It has the task for application. It gives you information on the different state scholarships. It gives you directions on how to apply for college. It's a wealth of knowledge. So if anybody wants to take that down, jot that website down, I'm going to give you a minute to do so at this time. And while we're waiting... Are there any questions of what I've covered up until this point? Any questions? <clears throat> okay. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Institutional aid, like I said, these are going to be the, the money available via the college. And so this is just where I put in the schools where I attended. So to kind of show, because sometimes students are asking me, well, where do I go on the website? Or how do I find what scholarships are available? Or how do I do this? Or how do I do, do that? And so I'm going to see if it'll pull up. Let me switch my little share. And I'm kind of partial to Prairie View. But be just understand that this these are the schools I attended. Um and so just to show you where you would go. And so it's all about getting into school. And so when you go to admissions, first tab talks about financial aid and scholarships. And so you can go here and find out about their financial aid and all the different types of aid that they have available. And it talks about grants and uh, loans. and also scholarships. So you can see that you can go to the different institution websites and you can 
um, see what money they have available. All right, let me get back to my PowerPoints. <clears throat> and so most schools, when you go to their website, they're going to have that same type of setup. They're going to have some type of tab. You'll click there and it'll give you the information concerning their financial aid process, concerning uh, different deadlines, and also the money that they have available via the, the school. Now, when it comes to how much you can get, that depends. Depends on how much money is available for that particular year. Then it also depends on this information that they, the information they collect from the FAFSA and they put it into what they call um, the expected family contribution. Then they look at the schools where you're attending. They put together information or they include information for tuition, room and board, and these different fees that are ass assessed. And that becomes your cost of attendance. They subtract the two. That's how much money you need. Now, <laughs> the effect, the uh, expected family contribution, it's based on just the information that's put into the facts. There are some things that the particular, that, that financial aid application doesn't assess. They, they ask a lot of questions. They do take some things into consideration, but there are other things that, that they don't. So sometimes the different schools will also have forms that you can fill out to give them more information than maybe what's available in the FAFSA. So the taxes that you filed that particular year may say one thing, but a, you know, somebody may have you lost a job or a health crisis may have occurred. So then there's other factors that will come into play that may not necessarily be re reflected on your FAFSA. So your financial need, your, your expected family contribution may look a little daunting, but then there are ways when you're working with the actual school to, to get those other factors considered so that you can still receive some financial aid. There's also an estimator that's available on studentaid.gov. And so it'll kind of give you an idea. It's not a, uh, you know, a, a fixed thing. It's not a for sure thing, but it'll give you an idea of where you stand as far as financial aid. So if you want to kind of preview it, if you're not quite a senior this year, you can go into the estimator, do it, and see what kind of uh, numbers you get back. Now, this information is based on the 2021 freshmen into college. So these are some of the different grants and federal things that are, are available. So for example, the 2021 uh, freshmen that qualify for the federal Pell Grant, they were able to get $6,345 for, that's for the year. Okay, so you get awarded your financial aid for the year. Federal work study is going to be based on what's available on the campus. And so that's where you go in and you you see the students that are working in the computer labs or working in the different offices, working in the registrar office, admissions office. So these students are working, getting paid, and they can use that money toward um, their fees and things that they need for college. We love work study. And work study, the students usually, wherever you're working, they're going to work around your school schedule. So it, it, it's very flexible, and it's a way for you to earn money and still be able to be a full-time student. We also, uh, they also <laughs> do the direct subsidized loans, which are loans where the government is paying the interest while you're in school, and then up-subsidized loans where you're going to pay the interest at the end. And so they are going to determine how much you're able to borrow 
uh, your school will through the financial aid process. And then there's the direct plus loan, which is a loan that parents can take out to to um, help their, their youngins pay for school. Now I'm gonna take this little opportunity to throw in my little two cents on loans. I always, 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 I usually use myself as an example, but when it comes to loans, take what you need and give back what you don't. You only need to use, they're gonna sometimes give you more than what you need. Especially when you go to grad school. I, I don't know. They just, so they'll give you more than what you need, but take exactly what you need and return the rest. Because you want loans, you don't want to, to get out of college dealing with a whole lot of debt. So you're, you're wanting to put yourself in the best position possible once you've earned that diploma, that degree. So loans are just something you want to use what you need, and that is it. And when I say use what you need, if you only need $1,000 and they give you five, take only what you need. Okay? Um, it's very important because that, that's the main point. You don't want to get out and be like this, this old counselor who's been in the game 22 years and still paying off loans from 1998. So please make sure that um, use what you need. That that's I always say, take heed, use what you need. And then this part talking about the state aid, I've already showed you all of that. Um, and we talked about college, uh, the college, uh, they provide scholarship opportunities on the campus. And there are also some search engines where you can get scholarship information. This is just two that I've used and I've had students to find scholarships that they were able to get using these. Once again, this is connected to the internet. And so sometimes even with the, the best resources and the best intentions, sometimes scam scammers get involved. So if they're ever asking you for money, you want money. Why would you give somebody money when you're trying to find money? So you shouldn't have to pay for anything. You shouldn't have to give out a whole lot of, like your social security number, they don't need all that. They don't need all your business to give you some money, okay? So just be mindful of the information that they're requesting. And so if it's seeming like they're asking too much that the you know personal financial that type of situation you may want to be a little leery um of 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 that particular scholarship but these resources will link you with national scholarships for you you can think of it there's probably a scholarship a tied to it uh i i every year i, I have them laughing uh, when I was in high school, I got a scholarship because I was left-handed. Um, there's one, the one of the financial aid officers that I work with, she talks about there's one if you believe in a zombie apocalypse. So there's money out there, and some of it does sound far-fetched, but they're giving scholarships for it. There are some where all of they ask you to, all they ask you to do is to put your name into a sweepstakes. I've had students that have gotten a thousand dollars just because they put their name into a sweepstakes. It didn't ask them any personal information, just name, email address. They did a, a random drawing, their name popped up, they got the thousand dollars. So um, if, it, if you look for it, nine times out of 10, it will be there. Also parents, where you work, Go to the human resources department on your job and see about uh, the scholarships that are available for the uh, children of employees. And so there's, there's money. It's just that usually you have to do the research. You have to dig and be willing to put in the research, put in the work. <clears throat> 
Now, this part is going into how do you apply for the aid. And so you apply, FAFSA.gov is going to take you to studentaid.gov. So the new website that they're using is the studentaid.gov. So you can do the federal application there. Remember, if they're asking you for money, that's the wrong website. Because I think if you go to FAFSA.com, they're going to want you to put in some money. So make sure it's a .gov, FAFSA.gov, studentaid.gov will take you to the website. And I have some screenshots of the actual website. The College for All Texans, that's how you'll do the FAFSA. And then remember, what for the individual schools, you'll have to go to their websites to see exactly what the, the process is to apply. And then, of course, the, 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 the world of scholarships, you just have to look for them, find the, um, get the application or the directions. I know with ours, we try to post our scholarships that we have access to or that we know about on our website. Uh, we actually have sometimes hard copies of applications, even though a lot of people are moving from the hard copies. But we'll try to put hard copies or flyers, uh, informational flyers. Um, and uh, we have a bookshelf where it's a um, just going to be our resource place for students to come in and get it. So your counselor uh, is a good resource. Um, and like I said, the Internet, just be mindful uh, and leery of, of things where they're asking you for uh, money when you're trying to get it. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again. So the first thing you have to do is create a FAFSA ID. And this is going to be your electronic signature. <clears throat> and so studentaid.gov is where you're going to go because they've migrated from all the different websites and they're putting everything on studentaid.gov in one central location. You will set up a FAFSA ID as the student. Parents will set up a FAFSA ID as the parent. And so when it asks for signatures, you'll use your FAFSA ID. That is going to be your signature for the application. And we keep up with this FAFSA ID. If you're a parent and you have multiple children, you will keep the same FAFSA ID and you will use that with each, each of your kids as they go through the financial aid process. Gather all the documents that you need. There's actually what they call a FAFSA on the web worksheet. So there's all these different uh, things that you can download, but the FAFSA on the web worksheet, they update it every year, and it basically tells you what documents you're going to need, where you're going to need them, and it helps you to get organized so that when you actually sit to do the FAFSA, you'll have everything you need at one time. And you can actually go through the process a little faster because you're organized. So this FAFSA on the web worksheet is going to help you get organized prior to so that when you sit down, you're ready to rock and roll. <clears throat> we talked about applying the studentaid.gov October 1st. Be mindful of all deadlines. Um, the first is usually a busy day. Because all of those college kids, everybody that's getting their uh, high, uh, graduate degrees, everybody that's already in college, they're, they're, they're going to start the application. And so I've had some students that said, Miss Senegal, I tried to get on, but the website, but give it a couple days, baby. It's got to catch up with the, the workload that, that it has. But yes, you want to get it on the first or as close to the first as possible. Put in all of your... Get all of your information done and submit it so that you can be in this initial initial batch of students that are being considered for A. And I was so happy when they moved it to October 1st because when it was January 1st, you got to wait for your W, to, you know, your stuff to come in so you can do taxes. Then you got to do your taxes. Then you got to turn around and apply. So it pushed back. It had people applying for FAFSA in February. But now that we have it in October, you use your previous year's taxes and you're ready to rock and roll and you know where you stand. 
um, that they're continuously making changes and enhancements. You can check on your aid, apply for your aid on cell phones. There's an app. Of course, you can do it on a tablet or you can do it on your laptop. So you can have your information at your fingertips, basically. All right, so these are some of the screenshots of the beginning, I mean, of the studentaid.gov webpage. Um, so when you go here, so you can kind of make sure you're on the right page, you'll see where it says Federal Student Aid. There is a part that says apply for aid, and that's where you're going to start. And so when you do the apply for aid, you're going to go to complete the FAFSA form. And then it's going to take you to the beginning of the FAFSA. So if you're a first time user, you're going to hit the click start here. And then, hold on, I think I got that slide it's going to start asking you some, some information. So they want to know who's filling out this FAFSA. Are you a student? Are you a parent? Or are you a preparer? And there are people out there that you can pay to do your FAFSA for you. But if you got that kind of money, you, you probably, you know, <laughs> are not looking to get a whole lot of financial aid because this is something that you don't have to pay to do but there are people out there but at the end of the day they can't get you any more money than anybody else all they can do is ensure that everything you're putting in is correct so you will put you know pick whichever choice and then it's going to take you in and you can put in uh some of the information the first thing is going to ask you to choose the year and so please make sure you choose the correct year so if you're currently a senior in high school your freshman year of college is going to be the 2022-2023 school year so you're going to choose that FAFSA to fill out because when it pulls up and I'll show you real quick are we gonna switch see it gives you Last the it gives you the current year and the next year, and that tends to throw students off. So you're gonna put the application in for your freshman year of school. Now I know <laughs> there's a, a lot of questions, especially when it can, uh, goes to the early college students, and so there are some issues that they may individually have to work out with the school of their choice. Um, they're still going to do the 22-23 FAFSA, but then there's some questions down the line that they're going to have to get some assistance on answer, especially if you earn an associate's degree. Now, the schools may also ask you to go back and do the current year FAFSA, the 21-22. And let me explain why. Sometimes there's funds left over in the summertime for school. And so if you qualify for some of those grants, some of those funds, you may be able to get summer school paid for. And I, I've had that happen. My niece, she actually filled out <laughs> the current year FAFSA on accident. And when I was checking her FAFSA, I said, oh, girl, you did the wrong one. So she went back. She did the year, her freshman year, but that actually ended up being a blessing in disguise because when she got to Prairie View in her summer program, because there was some money left over, especially with COVID, her summer school actually was paid for because they did have some money and she qualified. So there may be an, an instance where you'll do the current year, but for the most part, you're going to do the next year because that's when you're going to be the freshman. Now, once you've gone through your application process, you filled out all of that stuff. Um, there's an hour the number from this part of your uh, taxes here. So it usually tells you line by line, but if you just want to tell them, get it directly from the source, 
you can use the IRS data retrieval tool and it will automatically upload your information from the IRS into your application. So once you all of that, you get to the end, you make sure that when you submit your data, you check for any mistakes, go back and review, make sure everything is in there correctly, um, and then make sure you submit. They're gonna, you can just take by mail off. Not, you're gonna get a response by email. We, we are moving, we're in that point where it's gonna be strictly uh, watching emails. So then please make sure that you pay attention, check your emails. So if you're not a person that checks your emails on a regular basis, it could be a problem. You could miss out on some information, check your emails. I've had students not be able to get into college because they didn't check their emails and they missed deadlines. So they may want some more information from you. You need, they're gonna send that information, they're gonna tell you what they need via email. And so you wanna get everything done in a timely manner. So you're gonna have to watch your emails. So it's very important. If you're somebody that check your email once a week, you're gonna be somebody that's checking their email every day. Okay, and then what happens next? You wait. When the school starts sending you information, because you're gonna put, I think it's up to five or 10 schools, you're gonna list those schools that you're wanting. And so you're gonna weigh your options because the aid that you may get from one school may look a little different than the aid you get from another school. And so when you start seeing what comes in, then you start evaluating your options. And usually I tell students, which one gives you the least amount of money out of pocket? And so that's what you're gonna start looking to see because you can only accept financial aid from one institution. You're gonna decline all others. So you're only gonna take one award letter. Then once you've decided I'm going here, then you'll be in direct contact with that financial aid office to, to make sure that everything's in play, lined up, so that when you get ready to start registering for classes and every, all those other things that come with school, then you at least have your finances lined up. Now, this little part I tagged in at the end is because sometimes we have little things that are issues. I am not the financial aid guru. I pick up the phone and I call the financial aid officers at whatever school will answer the phone the quickest. Because the information is pretty much the same from school to school because they all have rules that they have to follow. So these are some common things that come up just what I in, in, in going through the financial aid process. Who is a parent? I know y'all figuring like, why that's a, why that's a problem? Because it just depends on where they live in. Who is a parent? Who is it? So in general, you're going to have your biological people your, as your parent, an adoptive parent, or a person that the state has legally designated as your guardian. These are your parents. Okay? Um... When I saw this, I said, I'm just going to include it <laughs> so they can see the, the different questions you will ask to figure out who you need to put on your financial aid. Are your parents married to each other? Yes. Then you're going to put both of them on the information. No. Do your parents live together? There are some situations where they're married, but yes, they live together. Put them both live with for most of the last on the fast and it gets it gets sticky sometimes 
because I live with this parent, but that parent is the one that claimed on the taxes. And so when we get to those where we don't know, parents, students, you can go to your high school guidance counselor or you can go to the institution ex uh, themselves, their financial aid office, or office and ask some questions and get some clarity on how to proceed. This is a biggie. <clears throat> and usually what ends up happening when they figure they, they want, you know, students usually say, I had a kid, I'm a parent, so I'm an independent student. No, these are the criteria to be considered an independent student when you're filling out the FAFSA. And it's important that the students, because I know that that's usually a big thing when I'm working with students. Yeah, if you a parent, that's fine. However, if your parents are taking care of you and your child, you're still dependent. So there's some there's some criteria that has to be met for that. So as you can see, if you're 24 by January 1st of the award year, you're considered independent. If you're married or separated but not divorced, independent student and believe it or not in high school I have students who are married um, working on your master's or doctorate degree served in the US Armed Forces or you're a veteran um, since the age of 13 had no living parent and were in the foster care or were a ward of the court um, and and those students usually their tuition is waived if they stay in the state of Texas so it's important that, you know, I've had kids that they've had grand dreams to go here and there. And I'm like, can you just stay in the state and get your degree, then go? Because they're going to pay for you to go to school. Um, if you're an emancipated minor, you have a court order, ordered legal guardian. You have children or dependents and provide more than half, that's 51% at minimum, of their support. And then last but not least, you're an unaccompanied youth who is homeless. And you have to be both. Because I'm learning uh, as the years roll on that there are a lot of things that mark students as homeless. So, but you have to be unaccompanied and homeless. And I have a slide about that. So then you would file as, in, as an independent. That means I don't have to put any of my parents' information on there. And so I talked about this, students with dependents, you got to provide, and you have to be able to prove that you provide more than 50% of the support. They're not going to just take your word for it. They're going to ask for additional documents. With homeless, I talked about that a little bit. Homelessness is lacked, lacking fixed, regular, and adequate housing, but you also have to be unaccompanied. So students have to meet both conditions to qualify for homelessness. Financial aid administrators, which that's the people that you're working with at the colleges, they can't override your, your dependency, dependency status. But they're going to need, you have to hit some special circumstances. So if you don't meet any of those other criteria to get a dependency override, you have to meet some special circumstances and I'll show you those but there's going to ask for documentation so you have to be prepared to do to have documentation and sometimes it, it's not you know it may be an uh, application you have to fill out from the university this stuff is going to be documentation provided to a university because usually any type of special circumstances they're going to put you in what they call a review and so you know, you may have, I've had to write letters for students and, and help to serve as, as a, to help verify that the statements that they're saying is accurate. So be prepared that if that's one of those criteria where you fall, then you have to prove it. And so to do the overrides, like I said, documentation has to be provided. The college will make their decision. So dependency override, how it goes, the process is unique based on the university. Um, it's at their decision. 
and it's only good for that year. So that means that every year you're going to have to probably go through the process to get it done. These are examples of special circumstances. And look at what they, what they have. Parent is incarcerated. You're uh, fleeing an abusive family environment. You don't know where your parents are or how to contact them. Look at what doesn't qualify. And it may shock some people, but I'm, I'm here as a witness. There are parents that refuse to provide their information for whatever reason. They do have valid reasons for not wanting to provide it in some cases. There's some fears there. You know, I'm, I'm not a legal citizen. I don't want to give you my information. I don't know if that's going to put me into a situation where I may be deported. So there are some sometimes, you know, issues where parents are going to say, uh, I, I, I'm not going to give any of my information. Parents don't want to help pay for the college. You think you grown, you on your own? Figure out how you're going to pay for school. And we've, I, we've encountered that. Student doesn't live with a parent. And so the student left for whatever reason. And now they're either living with a family friend, living with a relative. Sometimes they're just living with friends. And then your parents don't claim your own taxes. So these are not considered special circumstances. So you'll have to work with the institution to figure out how to work around whatever the issues are. And that parent not, you know, refusing to provide, that's a biggie. Where can you get more info? Studentaid.gov. I got this PowerPoint from studentaid.gov. They give counselors and educators resources to share. Um, so there's webinars that you can go and view as a parent, as a student, with webinars for educators. Um, you can talk to someone. There's a, a, a hotline that you can call and get information. But studentaid.gov is the one-stop shop. That's where all of your resources are. These are some of the resources that I used to tweak the PowerPoint. Like I said, the bulk of it came from studentaid.gov, but I also included some information from College for All Texans, scholarships.com. Um, I attended webinars with US Fire, which they also work with parents and students on uh, financial aid um, after, after high school, transitioning into the college. And then, of course, I, I use the Texas On Course, which is another uh, resource that has things set aside just for educators, but it also has stuff set aside for parents. So I'll leave this up for a second if anybody want to jot down some of the websites. So I don't, uh, I, I don't recreate the wheel. I tap into my resources. And so if I don't have the answer, I'm going to tap into a resource to try to find you the answer. Our next presenter is Dr. Marilyn Parker. She is a licensed professional counselor, supervisor, and national certified counselor specializing in the journey of mental wellness. She possesses over 15 years of professional counseling experience, working with children, adolescents, and adults in private practice, hospitals, and public school settings in Texas and Louisiana. Additionally, Dr. Parker is a 25-year former public school educator and mental health intern supervisor. In an effort to foster her legacy of caring for at-risk populations, Dr. Parker is the founder and CEO of the Wise Pearl Foundation that provides community resources to at-risk youth and families. Throughout her years of service, she has received numerous awards and recognition for her community service and business expertise. Dr. Parker is very influential in serving as a teen, young adult mentor and local volunteer with community agencies in Houston, Texas and its surrounding areas. Dr. Parker is an active member of the Texas Counseling Association, Louisiana Counseling Association, National Board for Certified Counselors, National Association of Professional Women, 
and member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And on a personal note, my 1987 classmate. Um, please receive Dr. Parker with the hashtag cap air high five. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Sara Nadra. Greetings, Sarars, parents, mentees, and other guests. Thank you for being here on today. Wow, Miss Danielle, you gave out so much information. I feel like I need to go back to the drawing board and wonder what I could have done differently to attend college. Thank you for that. Um, I am here today to share information that I also hope will be beneficial when we talk about uh, our teens, uh, young adults transitioning from home. Uh, into the college experience. Um, so let me share, you know, I'm going to give you a little preface here. Um, I'm going to be very honest, very direct, but I would look forward to questions, uh, comments at the end. I'll be more than happy to answer or uh, hear uh, any situations that need to be heard that, you know, I may be able to help with. So here we go. Open hearts and open minds. So Ms. Danielle has pretty much covered, you know, the, the collegiate experience as far as applying for financial aid. There's only one thing that I want to add. 18 and up, please stay away from credit cards. Going to college, I know that uh, finding funding can be quite difficult, but if at all possible, stay away from credit cards. If your parents have credit cards and they choose to make you an authorized user, that's great but also remember temptation is real. So if your parents give you authorization for a credit card, they give you the criteria, please stick to that criteria so that you do not use, lose, I'm sorry, that opportunity. So I'm gonna jump right into the heart of things. Leaving for your freshman year and parents becoming possibly an empty nester. So we know that COVID, we hopefully we're on the home stretch of COVID, uh, bringing it to a close um, so that you guys can go to college and have what we consider a normal experience. In the event, it's not quite there yet, it's okay. It's okay, you still have great opportunities ahead of you. So I've just listed some things that I, I want the freshmen to be uh, concerned about and attentive with. The first thing is go ahead and create all the memories in the world that you can your senior year with your family and your friends. If you know that you're going to miss them and it may be quite difficult for you, create as many memories as possible. You know, uh, take trips, uh, go to dinner, uh, create things at home, uh, you know, spend some time. And I'm going to tell you something that I've recently learned um, as a therapist working with kids who are making this transition in their parents. A lot of times the siblings miss each other, but they don't know how to express it or how to address it. So if you have a sibling that gets on your nerve, it's okay. You may just miss them when you leave and they're more than likely are gonna miss you. So create memories with your siblings as well. Freshmen, please know you're not the only new kid on the block going to college. If you're having fears about, you know, entering uh, college, you know, getting on the campus, going into the dorm rooms, you're not the only one. All of you more than likely feel the same way. So we're going to talk about how to address that. Knowing that you're going to college, the first thing is making sure that you have responsible habits for being independent. That will reduce some of the anxiety and some of the, the fears with the unknown. It's never too late to take on responsibilities at home. If you can maintain your academic status and work, work. Learn that experience of interacting with individuals all with all of these different personalities. Because when you get to college, you're going to embark upon multiple personalities. No one's the same. And it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just going to be a learning experience. So take advantage of any opportunity to be responsible, take on more tasks at home, uh, whatever in school as well. Take on, you know, different responsibilities with organizations, you know, your clubs, whatever you do. But build your ability to be responsible because that's going to help you with becoming an independent young adult. 
When you get to college, what would that independence look like? Hopefully, a well-balanced college experience, whether it's with studying and or working. You're going to party to a degree, but we'll talk about that. You have to know your limits, but make sure everything is balanced. And going to college, the one thing you should always know is academics come first, no matter whatever else is going on. So work toward that, start now. Choosing your roommate. I noticed that some universities give you the opportunity to go into the system and put in the individual's name. They have to put your name in and then they link you up as roommates. Not all universities do that, but some do. If you have that as an option, maximize it. Go in, you guys decide if you're gonna to room together, put your names in, lock in, but it doesn't stop there. You need to learn more about each other because guess what? You never lived together before, more than likely, unless it's a, a, a you know a, a close family member. Maybe living with someone is totally different than being just friends. Everyone does not have the same living habits, so that means whether you know the roommate or you don't know the roommate, get to know them. Go ahead and designate what's going to go on in that room. How you going to respect each other's privacy and space? If you're going to, you know, share a refrigerator, share a microwave, what does that look like? Cleaning habits, how are you guys expected to clean? Are you going to make sure you clean that shower when you get out? You know, you're going to clean the full bathroom. You're going to make up your bed. What are you going to do to be respectful of each other so that that's a successful experience? Also, as a freshman, parents going in to help getting set up, that's so much fun, but you have to leave. You cannot stay. If you equip your team, your young adult, before they exit your home, give them the opportunity to implement what you've taught them. So when you drop them off at college, please do not stay a week, two weeks. I know parents who have just gotten a hotel room and stayed. Don't do that because that may be adding fear to your freshmen. Don't do that. Entrust what you've taught them, and we're going to talk about some safety measures to put in place. So kind of going back to talking about parents, you know, helping the kids be prepared to exit home. You know they're going to be leaving your home one day. So don't wait until the last minute to start to mentally prepare yourself for that moment. Work on acceptance that they're going to be transitioning. Again, you don't want to transfer your feelings onto the child, the freshman who's leaving. They don't need that extra guilt going to college. They already have a, a lot that's on their plate ahead of them. So don't add to it where they're feeling sorry for you or worried about you. What you can look forward to are holiday breaks, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and generally the semester ends early in December for the fall. They'll be home soon. They have extended weekends, you know, Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend. They have opportunities to come home in, in the event they're not that far away. Maybe not if they're, you know, out of state or whatever, I understand. But know that you'll have that time with them. Also, you have FaceTime, Google Duo, texting, emailing, sending pictures. There are ways to stay connected where you're not as, as worried about them. But let me go back to when I, when I mentioned FaceTime, Google Duo, texting. There should be a limit to the frequency of that. If it's the initial drop off, we get it. That first week or two, they're checking in throughout the day. That's great but you need to wean yourself off of it. Wean yourself off of it so that they can step into this independence and not still be so dependent upon you and you're not there. They have to go out and learn how to make it. This is a tough question to hear, but it is a question I ask all parents. God forbid, but if something happened to you, would your child be able to make it on his or her own? 
And if your answer is no, then you definitely need to pull back. Model for them, communicate with them clearly, let them share, and let them move forward with what you've taught them. You got to take your hands off to a degree. It doesn't have to be immediate, but gradually. We do not want to handicap a kid. Now I'm talking to the freshman, the teen, the young adult. Your parents are generally concerned because a lot of times you guys don't pay attention to your surroundings. You have to pay attention. I watch you guys come out of Walmart and grocery stores. Your heads are on the cell phones. Nobody's looking around. Human trafficking is real. Theft is real. Getting robbed. You have to pay attention to your surroundings. You guys do not really understand what harm is. And we don't want you to really understand, not to that degree, but at least to have the awareness that harm exists and how it could potentially impact your life. Pay attention to your surroundings. Try not to go anywhere by yourself. Have someone with you. Do not share any of your personal information with roommate or anyone else, be very protected, protective of your social security number. That's important, don't leave your social security card around. Some parents may keep the card while you're at college, I don't know. But if you possess your own social security card, that needs to be under lock and key. When you're choosing your college and you're gonna keep up with friends, you guys say, oh, we're going to the same university, You know, we're gonna to roommate together or whatever. Please make sure that that person is responsible. You have to pay attention to good loyalty versus troubled loyalty. Good loyalty is the person I'm connected to, I'm linked up with that I call friend is productive. They're doing their schoolwork. They're not getting into trouble. They're not making poor decisions. So that's good loyalty. Troubled loyalty is well, this is just someone I grew up with since I was really young. But that person is using drugs, uh, using alcohol, maybe being promiscuous. That would not be beneficial for you. So please choose your company wisely. Make sure they're responsible so that it continues to support you in your efforts. Underage drinking, I'm going to say it. Of course, it happens at the college level. But you better be certain, freshman, if that's something you're going to be wise about or not. Any drunkenness, le any level of intoxication, there's harm that could be sitting there lurking and you're unaware. Be very careful what you partake in. And I'm gonna leave that at that. That's a parent conversation. But know that any level of intoxication can create a situation that you will not be ready for. And we're gonna talk about that in a couple of bullets. Parents, when you visit the campus to drop your freshmen off, you should know where they live, where their classes will be held, that they know where the health clinic is and the police department before you leave the campus. They need to know where those things are located. Yes, freshman to be, your parent needs a tracker on you. It is not to be all in your business. It is for your safety. So I urge parents and freshmen to agree as to what that would look like. How will it be utilized? But it is a necessity. I said it a moment ago, human trafficking is real. So it's not a matter of your, your parent being nosy, it's a safety concern, very much so. Parents do not allow that freshman to dictate what you will and will not do when it comes to tracking them. This is your call. And I'm gonna leave that at that. So this is why I say the tracker is important and paying attention to whether or not if you're partaking in 
you know, drugs or alcohol because date rape is real. And it is on the rise. It is on the rise. Social media, I understand it's fun, it's entertaining, but it can also create an environment where you're not safe. A lot of teens and young adults love to post their location. Well, you don't know who may pull up, as you guys say. You don't know who may pull up. You never know who you're entertaining on that, that social media because you might be catfished. Who you think you're talking to may be someone else. Could be a rapist, could be a general criminal. You don't know. There's an article that just came out October 13th of this year, of this month, about sexual abuse among teens. I have the link here at the bottom on the screen, but I also put it uh, at the top in the chat if you want to go and read it for yourself. And it talks about date rape, sexual abuse is real and it is on the rise. There was a study conducted, 26% of the females were victims of date rape and didn't even know it until after the study. This is gonna be a little different from what we're used to hearing because it was new information to me. The article talked about when we raise kids to feel entitled. 